my name is Frankie, and I'm a healthcare experience designer. So do we have anybody else in the audience who's working in healthcare experience design? Awesome, I see a couple of hands. Well, I want to encourage everyone here to find a way to be involved with healthcare experience design because it's incredibly meaningful and there's a huge amount of opportunity. By which I mean healthcare pretty much sucks. <laughs> so I'm from Washington, D.C., which is here in the U.S. And this is where I work. It's the innovation hub at Sibley Hospital. It's about 350 square meters. It's a dedicated space and a dedicated team for innovation. And our CEO, Chip, created the Innovation Hub in 2014, around the same time as he... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> around the same time as he defined the new mission and vision for the hospital. And this is printed on the back of everybody's badge. I'm wearing mine here. And you can see whether it says at the bottom innovation or nurse or doctor or housekeeping. On the back, it says the same thing. The mission, it won't surprise you, the mission is to provide excellent and compassionate care for every person every time it seems appropriate for a hospital. But the vision is that Sibley Hospital will be the role model for innovation in healthcare. And I was hired to help build that culture of innovation, which we did. And I'm very proud to say that it has been changing. Take a look at this badass. Clara Barton is the founder of the American Red Cross. And she's one of my innovation heroes. Her portrait hangs above my desk in the Innovation Hub. And she said, I have an almost complete disregard for precedent. I defy the tyranny of precedent. I go for anything new that will potentially improve the past. It irritates me when people say how things have always been done. And if you talk to frontline staff at Sibley Hospital now, this is a common attitude. And I am proud to have been changing that culture. But it relies on trust, and that has been the difficult, the slow road to make people believe that working with the Innovation Hub will not be a waste of time. So this is one of my favorite projects from the last year creating a new charter for case coordinators in our hospital. And most people don't know what case coordinators do. I didn't know what they did. A lot of doctors don't know what they do. A lot of other people in other departments don't know what these critical members of the hospital community do. And the director of case coordination came to me in the Innovation Hub. Her name is Elise. And Elise said, can you help me communicate to my staff and other people in the hospital, how important their work is to the mission of our hospital. And so I organized a series of listening sessions. And we brought all of these case coordinators down into the Innovation Hub. There's 25 of them. We brought them in groups of four and five and had them talk about their work. And you can see here one of these listening sessions this is my fabulous intern, Dylan, running this session. We gave each of the case coordinators five post-it notes, a marker, and 10 minutes to draw their job. They had to draw their job in five panels. And if you've ever taken one of Morrow's excellent visual communication workshops, you know where I got that idea. And so after... Two weeks, we'd, got, we'd talked to all of these, these case coordinators. We had about 100 post-it notes, drawings that they'd drawn 
of their work. About 100 post notes, and we started sorting through them like you do synthesis. And we sorted them into 30 themes, and you can see in the background there the pages with these themes on them. And then we started doing some iterative prototyping, and so we put them into these books, and we would bring them to the case coordinators and bring them to Elise and, and get feedback and bring them back to the Innovation Hub and revise and change the wording and bring them again and reprint and revise. And there were many rounds of this going back and forth and getting feedback and making changes and iterating with our users. I showed it to doctors also. There's one page where I had written this message that I had heard from the case coordinators uh, and a doctor looked at it, and, and she was like, why do you have to be so rude about this? And I realized, okay, that's a good point. I mean, it is, this is an accurate representation there, saying uh, we feel this way about this thing that happens with doctors. The doctor's like, okay, I'm not proud of that, but it's not consistent. It's not everybody. Just can you change the wording a little bit? I said, sure. This still was effectively communicating the message. And so the final version looked like this. The pages we had consistent uh, visual vocabulary, redrew each of those post-its into these themes. And at the bottom was a little paragraph, a, a caption that explained what's happening in this part of that work. And it wasn't easy for Elise to get the $600 from her budget that she needed to print 100 copies of these books, to give one to each of the case coordinators and give them to other department heads and some physicians and have some more available for future case coordinators that might be hired. But after a lot of emailing and phone calls and pinging, I made it happen. I, I made it happen by being persistent. And this is the stack of them. The day that they arrived at my office, and I opened them, and I was just so excited. I have actually a real copy of it in my bag right there, if anybody would like to look at it later on. It's very, uh, it may be the most interesting case coordination charter you have ever read. <laughs> but it's because of the trust that I have built with people like Elise, that people like Sade come and talk with me. So that's Sade kneeling there next to a wheelchair uh, in the Innovation Hub, in the maker space. We have a small area in the end of the Innovation Hub that's got tools and supplies for building prototypes. And Sade is a clinical technician, and she came down on her lunch break, and she came into the Innovation Hub, and if you looked at the Service Gazette, I wrote about this a little bit, and she said, are we allowed to make prototypes here? And she had this challenge where sometimes when a patient arrives in building A, they've driven, they've parked in the parking garage, and they have a walker. So they come into the hospital, they've got a walker, and they need to go to building D where she works. So the building D that her department will send her with a wheelchair to building A to pick up this patient. And so she has to now push this wheelchair and, and also bring their walker with them. And it's kind of awkward. And she, she said, I, I know it just doesn't look right, and it's hard to do. And sometimes I can fold up that walker and put it on their lap, like they're a shelf made of meat. <laughs> and that's just awkward, and sometimes it falls off, and it just feels rude. Is there something better we could do? So we, I gave her some Sharpies and some paper, and we started drawing. And I said, you know, give me a drawing of what you have in mind. And then we used pipe cleaners. You can see that little pipe cleaner right there that she's attaching to this wheelchair. And then we used pla multiple plastic. And what we ended up with, after several rounds, were these simple 3D printed hooks that can fit on the back of the wheelchair. And we made them in the makerspace. And we actually could make them in the final version. And I, I'm pleased to say that they're on all of the transport wheelchairs now throughout the hospital. 
And this is Sade, a clinical technician. This is well below doctors and nurses in the hierarchy in the hospital. And standing on either side of her are the chief nursing officer and the chief executive officer, the CEO of our hospital, presenting her with an innovation award, a trophy, at the annual innovation awards in our hospital. And this is a meeting that's attended by all of the department heads, about 150 people, all of the management in the hospital. A quick story about these innovation awards. I want to recommend that, in, if it's possible in your work, to give awards to people on the front line. It's very, very meaningful. Last year, one of the winners was somebody I've worked with a lot and I really admire. Very, very smart and friendly and capable and accomplished. And she and I worked together on an innovation project and she won an award. And a couple weeks later, I went to her office and I saw this award sitting on her desk. And you can see that they're 3D printed. And they've got a little light bulb in the back so they can glow if you turn them on. There's some more back here. <laughs> and it had her name on it. And I said, oh, Kristen, your award, that's awesome. It's right on your desk. And she said, do you know that I've never won another award in my professional career? I said, holy crap, because you're awesome. When I was in college, I was very involved in student activism. And this is a picture of me on the front page of the newspaper protesting to save sea turtles. <laughs> and I learned a very important lesson as an activist, as an organizer, that when you are recruiting people to join the revolution, it doesn't happen overnight. You build trust in droplets. And you lose it in buckets. And the revolution in this case is making healthcare not suck so much. If I'm going to make a difference, it's going to be by connecting with frontline staff and supporting them persistently. But nobody is going to connect with me unless they believe that I will be there tomorrow supporting them. As a full-time staff in the hospital, my paying client is the hospital. But my customers are people like DJ, this guy, he's a doctor. And DJ doesn't really care how much my work is gonna cost him in dollars. But his time is very precious to him. And so DJ came down to the Innovation Hub and he said, you know, I'm, I work with pain, I'm, a, I'm an anesthesiologist, and I'd like to figure out a way to increase the awareness of non-narcotic pain management options in the hospital. Because in the US, and I think everywhere, um, but probably more in the US, painkillers are a big part of the patient experience. And because of that, even though they are often prescribed appropriately, some people become addicted to them. Over -pre prescription is part of the problem and heroin addiction is, is part of the result. And he said, I just want to increase the awareness of things people can do because, because people ask for painkillers and nurses suggest that might be the right choice and doctors prescribe them. But we have other options in the hospital. And so I worked with DJ and this fabulous intern, Samire, and we talked with 18 nurses and nurse managers and some patients as well over the next few weeks. We interviewed them and we learned about what they knew about pain management and what they did for pain management there at the hospital. And then we came back and we did our synthesis session and we 
clustered our post-it notes and pulled out themes and generated some how might we questions. And then we th thought of a, about 52 ideas in half an hour, some inappropriate and some were fine. And, and when, when we chose one with dot voting, and it was this passport, this passport that had a page for each of the several options that we were, we were promoting, things like acupuncture or electronic nerve stimulation that are available in uh, the hospital. Uh, but it was a lot of iterations. It was maybe dozens of iterations of this and, and, and revisions and, and changes and, and, and feedback. How much time does a doctor really have for a voluntary innovation project like this to keep going through many committee approvals? It's not much. And if it weren't for someone like me pushing this, carrying this, it might never happen. In fact, two years later, it still is not a real thing in the hospital. Everyone agrees that it's a good idea. In fact, high quality, high fidelity prototypes like this have been used in photographs in promotional materials for the hospital already. <laughs> but it's not gonna be part of the revolution unless somebody like me is really persistent about it. This is an example of a small, successful battle in the revolution. Um, this are, these are the whiteboards that used to be in the intensive care unit, the ICU, in the hospital. And, and, and even when they were blank, they looked messy. The director of the ICU came down to the innovation hub and she said, help, can you help me make, design some new boards? And she had a couple of pictures on her phone of boards she'd seen maybe in another hospital. Uh, so I suggested we do some co-creation sessions, and so I brought up some paper and some markers to the break room of uh, the ICU at 7 a.m., which is when the, the night shift ends and the morning shift starts. We could talk to more of her staff at the same time. And over about half an hour, I had them, well, half an hour is a very long time for a nurse uh, to take off, to have a, a, a session like this. Uh, I had them draw prototypes and then explain them and, and share what, what they had with each other, of what might be the ideal layout for a new board. And then I started making nicer and nicer prototypes and printing them out and bringing them up to Lena, the nurse manager, the director of the, the ICU, and getting feedback and bringing them back down and, and revising them and bringing them back up. And that's a nice thing about being located in the hospital. I can just walk up to my users. It's so luxurious. And it was fascinating and it was rewarding and it was fun and it was the kind of design work that really drew me to be an experienced designer, working so closely with the users but uh, the, the, the next thing that had to happen was, once we got to a, a, a design that everybody really liked, we had to actually order them and then get them installed. And that's the part of this process that nearly killed this innovation. Because whose job was that? Well, it's obviously Lena's job. She's the person who took the initiative. She's the innovation champion. But every time I went up to check on it with Lena, she was immersed in the patient chart for some patient. Every time there was a challenge with the ordering process, it had to compete with the challenge of saving somebody's life. Well, finally, uh, we, I got a notification that the, the boards had been delivered. So I jogged upstairs to Lena, hey, let's look at the boards. And she's like, I don't know where they are. And so I went down to shipping and receiving. Hey, those boards, where are the boards? They're like, I have no idea. Uh, but why don't you go look in this one hallway, this shipping hallway. Uh, they might be there. And so I found them. There are 24 boards and 12 cardboard boxes stacked on pallets against the, against the wall. And so I went over to the facilities office and I said, hey, can you please install two screws in each room uh, so that we can uh, put these boards? And they're like, oh my gosh, 
we're so busy this week. Can you come back next week? I said, sure. And next week, same thing. Oh, my gosh, it's so busy, but come back next week. And next week, same thing. But in that process, I became friends with John Neese, who is the front desk person. And so I started coming down every day and just checking on. Sometimes I would bring little gifts. <laughs> and then one day, the boards were not in the hallway anymore. And I went over to John East, and she said, I have no idea where they are. <laughs> and it turned out they'd been moved to the sub-basement. Somebody cleaned the hallway, and now they were in this room. <laughs> but eventually, they were, the screws were installed, and uh, John East let me know the boards were there. And... One year later, I mean, they've been used every day since they were installed, and it may not look like disruptive innovation, but I guarantee you that for the nurses in the ICU, this is powerful innovation. I'm just gonna show you a couple of features of this boring looking board. Here, the patient can write, uh, or the nurse can write the preferred name of the patient. So if your name is Margaret, but everyone calls you Maggie, maybe you'd be happier if the nurses would say, hi Maggie, good morning, how are you doing? What is my biggest concern? What I would like you to know about me? If I have a central line or a Foley, or a, if I am a fall risk, these are things that are important for nurses to be very aware of. There's an easy way to show your pain on your pain scale here. I'd like to close with a quote from another one of my innovation heroes. This is Thomas Edison, and he's credited with the invention of the light bulb, among many other amazing things. Thomas Edison once said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Perspiration, that's sweat. You remember how I said that you build trust in droplets? <laughs> sweat is what the droplets are made of. Thank you. I'm in charge of the timekeeping, but I think you also gave us lots of food for thought, so I would like to open up for a few questions from the audience. The box is over there. Um, I see you doing a lot of things inside of the hospital that are, that are for the small, specific moments, and I think that that scales, but how do you see the, those things scaling across other hospitals? Uh -huh. How do I see these solutions scaling across other hospitals? The Sibley Hospital is owned by Johns Hopkins, so it's an opportunity for us to uh, create something that's meaningful at our hospital and then bring it to the other Hopkins hospitals and potentially beyond there. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, the, the main focus of our work is to design solutions for our hospital. So that's our, our main priority has been for um, since the, the start of the, of the Innovation Hub. Anyone else? Gabo? Next, oh, there's no next year, but next year we should have trained the throwing of the box. Um, yeah. Can you um, have an open session about that? Yeah, <laughs> good point. Yeah, um, yeah thanks, Frankie. Um, I heard it for a second time, and it's still, you know, a lot of inspiring things. We're going to steal all of your decks and stuff um, in my work. Gabor, let me practice with him on uh, Wednesday. So. <laughs> um, and um, we struggle with the same things in, in our hospitals. Um, um, can you tell us more about how you found your focus? Because there are a lot of complex things to learn to solve in a hospital. Um, and I think it's interesting that you've said um, about how much project you can do at the same time and how to focus on things. Yeah. So how do I choose what we're focusing on among, among many of the problems we could look at? Uh, the, the, the main thing for, for me is whether there is a motivated and enthusiastic design champion that's not me. Because I know that's what it takes to, to get something to cross, to, to win a battle in the revolution. 